Welcome back to Block TV. It's time now for Crypto Crunch, where we talk with one of the leading voices in the sphere with whom we are lucky enough to have a weekly chat. That is, of course, Lou Kerner of Crypto Oracle, the man behind Crypto Mondays. And today, we'll need to use your Oracle skills because there's so much still going on in the sphere and where we're headed to next. But firstly, Lou, thanks so much for joining us on Block TV. Hey, Ash, always great to be here. All right, so to kick things off this week, uh, I want to bring up uh, the latest decision that came out of the SEC. Of course, the decision to fine Block One at just $24 million, a bit of a humble number given the supposed estimated $4 billion they were able to raise uh, in their ICO rounds back in 2017-18. Lou, what do you make of this particular move? You know, I, I think that you know, what the SEC, the problems they had were, I think, you know, not that it was a, a, a scam or that they were trying to avoid doing certain things. I think they had infractions that the SEC thought were, you know, pretty minor in the scope of things. And so they find them a, a, a pretty modest amount. Um, you know, there were those who, you know, didn't understand relative to other fines that they've seen. But I think in those cases, you know, the SEC saw kind of more direct fraud than uh, than they saw. You know, I, I see the infractions as largely being, you know, not dotting I's and crossing T's that they should have. But still, I mean, pretty, pretty staggering for them to be able to, uh, you know, raise uh, that incredible sum without a clear stated uh, plan within their their ICO getting or raising around an estimated four billion dollars and only getting slapped down with a fine worth less than half a percent of the money that they raised I mean given the the uh, other actions taken by the SEC to crack down so hard on a lot of the ICO uh, uh, ICOs that came out in that era of 2017-18 uh, do you think this is is this got sort of any sense of being um, sort of a slap on the wrist, I suppose, that this doesn't do the due diligence that the SEC has been claiming they're intending to do? Well, look, I, I do think what this clearly points to, you know, the troubling aspect is, is the SEC still lacks clarity um, in, you know, oversight of, you know, this whole sector. And that's a, you know, has been a problem for a long time and continues to be a problem. This doesn't do anything to address that. And in fact, this might be, you know, it's acerbating it. Because in the eyes of a lot of people, you know, it was such a low fine relative to the amount raised. And so that's, you know, that's really the bigger issue, you know, and not just here in the States, but globally, um, you know, in a lot of other jurisdictions, including Israel. Yeah, certainly, it uh, seems that lack of clarity is so problematic and so many people are getting a, a degree of consternation regarding that. Not sure how to move forward, not sure when a slap on the wrist is going to come and when those harder fines are really going to be laid down and cracked down. But I guess uh, exactly. an interesting one and for the industry. It's easier, you know, it's easier for, for most companies just to avoid the United States altogether. Right. And that's what you know, we're seeing from the majority of projects. Certainly. So there is uh, that sort of dual system seeming to be forming some choosing to work in the United States and so many not. But speaking of those companies that are working in the United States and working within the regulatory framework, uh, we can't help but talk where a week post the backed launch. Uh, and in that time, we've seen the price of Bitcoin and crypto market as a whole tumble by double digit percentages, some attributing it to backed, uh, tepid launch as it were. And looking back at the numbers from the first week, backed was able to sell, execute only $5 million uh, worth of futures contracts in that first week. Whereas for a comparison, CME managed to execute $165 million worth of contracts on Friday alone. Uh, Lou, what is this? What's happened with backed? Wasn't it supposed to be the great savior for us all? Yeah, I, I think we got overexcited about, you know, the, the institutional reaction to, to back. And, you know, everybody's sitting and waiting for the institutional tsunami to come and think that that is what's going to drive the next leg of, you know, of Bitcoin forward. Uh, you know, I tend to have a more, you know, tepid view of that, you know, under the belief that, you know, the, the, the problem isn't the on-ramps or custodian you know, problems that a lot of people have talked about and, and a lot of people are working to solve for institutions. But the bottom line is today is, is you know, crypto and, and Bitcoin is still not well understood by institutions, even if they understand it well, you know, for multiple reasons. They just have no interest in it today. It's still a very, very small asset class uh, uh, in total. It's still obviously very volatile. And so, you know, the institutions who have gotten involved, I think, are, are very, very forward thinking. 
you know, and, and, you know, and they're certainly growing. So, you know, Fidelity's way out there in the, in the lead. There are others who are playing and others are going to come. But I think in the near term, it's not going to be the catalyst uh, for the next leg up that, you know, that a lot of people have been talking about for a long time now. But Lou, uh, given we've seen these low volumes in the first week, I mean, it, it is still just the first week. Uh, do you think that this is a definitive sign that uh, backed as a project is a failure? Or do you think there's still time to, uh, to right the ship, as it were? I, I, you know, I still think that BAT can play a role in helping to bring institutions to crypto. It's just not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in the first month. It's not going to happen in the first quarter. But this is, I think, you know, a multi-year project you know, until we get to the point where crypto is just another asset class that institutions buy and sell like they do, you know, junk bonds, right? Junk bonds didn't used to exist. Michael Milken introduced it to the marketplace. Most institutions said that they would never participate in the junk bond market. And today it's just an asset uh, uh, treated like in, by institutions just like every other asset. That's going to happen to crypto over time. But, you know, it's not going to happen this week because of that. No, certainly, uh, there seems that uh, there needs to be that warming up period in order to get people involved. As we always need to remember, cryptos are still so very new. Uh, so many people still need to come to terms with it. And that, that uh, segues nicely into my next point, which is a survey recently put out by Crypto Radar, which says that only 6.2% of Americans have ever invested in any form in Bitcoin. Do you find that number surprising? Uh, you know, I think that the, the number of people who were invested in Bitcoin in the U.S. is is so low that I think also, you know, any uh, uh, any survey like that probably is, uh, you know, is not that statistically significant. You know, the truth is, again, just like with institutions, for most Americans, they don't understand what Bitcoin is. Even if they do, they, you know, they struggle to buy it, even though that there are easy ways like GBTC, which, you know, is, is traded on the NASDAQ. Uh, and it's been a great way to own uh, to, to own Bitcoin, um, you know. But the nice thing is, is again, just like with institutions, every day Bitcoin gets a little bit easier to understand. It gets a little bit brighter, and I think a few more people see the crypto light. So it's really my view that it's going to be the retail side of things that's going to continue to drive, uh, uh, you know, crypto, uh, uh, the value of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies upward. You know, it's interesting, Lou, because although crypto is in people's minds, I mean, most uh, current surveys that have come out put the number of awareness of people who know about Bitcoin in some way or another, you know, recognize the, the brand, as it were, uh, between sort of 75 and 85 percent of Americans know the name and the brand that is Bitcoin, yet so few have invested. Does that indicate to you that there's perhaps still too many hurdles to getting people on board or uh, too much fear in the air, as it were? I just think it's it's largely yeah, a a lack of understanding of what Bitcoin is, um, but B also I think it's important to note that you know, I see it in a lot of other people obviously see Bitcoin today much more as a store of value like a digital gold than money, you know because obviously so few places accept Bitcoin, um, and if you compare the percentage of people who own Bitcoin to the percentage of people who own gold in the U.S., they're really actually hard uh, uh, to get numbers. But it's certainly widely believed to be far less than 10 percent of the U.S. population actually owns gold as a store of value. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, it's actually not dissimilar to Bitcoin. You know, the difference is, is that the people who own gold uh, tend to own a lot of gold. They tend to be you know, some of the wealthiest people uh, in the country as opposed to the people who own Bitcoin. Um, you know, today, you know, there's certainly some wealthy people who own Bitcoin. But it certainly skews on average to, to much less wealthy people than gold does today. Well, certainly, I hope. I think that those inve early investors are hoping that this will change in the long term. Maybe they'll end up being the ones left holding the uh, digital gold, as it were. But Lou, of course, we spend a lot of time talking about Bitcoin, but it's far from the only coin on the market, and the only far from the only coin doing anything inter interesting. I understand that you were recently at the Tezos Quorum, where there were some interesting developments. What can you tell us? Yeah, well, just the whole conference itself, um, they hold it about quarterly now uh, for the Tezos community. Uh, I actually had the pleasure of being at the first Tea Quorum in uh, uh, Paris, uh, which followed Paris Blockchain Week about six months ago. And, you know, the Tezos project, it's, it's super interesting. You know, it's, it's really, um, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the largest projects that's actually able to advance their governance and, and move forward. 
Um, and it has a, uh, a very vibrant community, which I think is one of the keys to success in crypto. Um, so you know, we're big believers in, in Tezos. Uh, and we got a chance uh, to actually host uh, the, the co-founder of Tezos, Arthur Brightman, uh, at Crypto Monday in New York uh, uh, in between days of the, of the conference. Uh, and you know, he's a super bright guy, said a lot of interesting things, but you know, the most interesting thing that, uh, you know, that I heard is um, you know, they have a, a, a staking program. It's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's proof of stake. Uh, they actually call it baking, uh, uh, where you get a, you know, a nice return for staking. Um, and one of the things that they're looking to change is you know, staking uh, uh, is viewed uh, uh, kind of similar to interest, so you need to pay taxes uh, in a lot of jurisdictions uh, on your staking rewards. And so what Tezos is thinking of doing instead of, you know, providing rewards, if, you know, for the people who stake is they're thinking of slashing the people who don't stake. So it ends up having the same exact effect in terms of kind of percentage ownership of all the outstanding uh, uh, Tezis, uh, the coins. Um, but it would save on the tax side of things. And that's why, obviously, it's important for these projects to have governance systems that can evolve and that can uh, react to the marketplace to help the, you know, the, the projects get better and better over time. And certainly, it's a, a critical element of the sphere to be able to develop that governance, to be able to develop those rules. And uh, interesting to see how different projects are moving ahead with that. Well, Lou Kerner, I want to thank you so much for giving us a taste of what's happening in and around the sphere and getting your take on the crypto world at the moment. So much happening, so much going on. It's important to get those voices out there and hear what's happening. Lou, thanks so much for joining us on Block TV and stay with us at blocktv.com for all the latest in news, information and the best of analysis. I'm Asher Westrop Evans. Thanks for watching. For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.